Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So my goal here today is to teach you some tips and tricks, more or less, of stuff I learned when I was both maintaining and contributing to open source project. So hopefully what you learn here today will be helpful for making your interaction with the open source a much happier space and maybe one day even become a maintainer. Okay. So let's start with who am I. So I'm Bernard Gabor. Uh, I work at Bloomberg as the slide might give away in the bottom right corner. I currently live in Los Angeles, but I'm originally from Transylvania. For those who you don't know, it's that little part of Romania there in the corner. And uh, more importantly for this package or this talk, I'm an open source contributor under that GitHub handle. And I primarily am a member of the Python Packaging Authority. I author slash maintain these virtual and PPAX build packages, but I maintain a lot more packages as you can see there. Uh, probably you heard about like Tox or Pip that pre to main uh, some of the bigger ones. Okay. Oh, I don't want to jump over that one. So I'm also more importantly parents to two Yorkshire Terriers, Silky and Junior, and I will call them on occasionally in the talk just to lighten up a bit the mood. Uh, okay. So let's start with the definition. So what is a maintainer? Well, if you look it up on dictionary.com, you kind of like see this long-winded explanation, but I think what's more relevant for our talk is probably the second one, namely this part of it, keep in appropriate condition operation. Uh, job of the maintainer is purely this one. More importantly, what is not a maintainer, at least in my opinion, it is not the guy who adds features for you to the project. It is definitely not the guy who fixes issues for you for the project. However, most maintainers occasionally do take on this mantle and head, uh, kind of like head too, but that's, near, no, that's not their primary job, so to say. That's more like they do that because they enjoy it rather than because they should do it. Okay? So, imagine you wrote your greatest package of the world and you want to like make it, make it open source now and you want to publish it. The first thing uh, your job as a maintainer of that package is to actually make sure that it is discoverable and the information is available for the users on how and when to use it. What this means, if you publish it, for example, to PyPI, you definitely should use this kind of like lovely information inside the, your PyProject.toml file, namely documentation, homepage, release notes, where the source code is and where they should submit the issue trackers. If you use these lovely tokens, for PyPI, you can see on this example, you're going to get lovely icons on the PyPI project showing exactly for the user where they should direct their probably thanks, but also their anger towards. Okay. So <coughs> another job of you is actually make sure that the project is easy to consume. Uh, what this means that's mostly, and that's kind of like kind of be maybe a recurring uh, thought throughout this talk, is follow the law of least surprises. Everything should basically be there and work as the user would expect it. So in case of the publishing your package means it should be installable through PIP, even for Conda if you want to make bonus points for the data science folks, and also do a, make sure that the code is available. Usually via GitHub, you can also do GitLab, but that kind of like violates this principle because let's face it, 90% of the project lives on GitHub. So that's where probably people will search for your code anyways. Okay, now another important task for you as a maintainer would be to actually send the ground rules, how people should interact with your project. This means that you should definitely define a code of conduct. This can be a small markdown, down, markdown file inside your GitHub project. As you can see here, we kind of like just roughly outline what should be the expectation. This can come handy if someone comes angrily with pitchforks at your issue tracker, you have at least something to point of them, why and how you deal with them, okay? So, now, this is another very important uh, task for a maintainer. You are the one that actually has to triage incoming bug reports. Your job is to make sure that when the user reports a problem, you are the deciding authority. Is that actually a bug? Or maybe it's a feature, just they don't know about it. Or maybe they're just using the package incorrectly. Or all three at the same time. So, you will spend a lot of your time actually doing this. Now, to make your life easier and the life of the people coming to your project easier, you should definitely use templates for the issues. Like you can see, for example, here for GitHub, you can create some uh, template reports, and then when the user wants to open issue, they are kindly guided which and how they should submit their uh, issue or feature request. 
for example, you can see here for an issue, they kind of like have a wee section where they just have to complete the information that you ask for them so you can actually troubleshoot and answer their questions. Okay? Now, I see, feel at this point I should probably mention about uh, communication is deceptively hard. And if you want to watch a longer session of this, you can see Ned Bachelor's uh, great keynote from last year's PyCons. Uh, mainly, the key takeaway is that we all have different communication styles. We all communicate differently. For example, if I respond to you with four short words, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm angry at you. It easily could be just that I may be just short word or succinct to the point rather than say a longer in the response to that. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're communicating. And written communication is even harder because when you write something down in issue tracker or on chat or wherever, you lose a lot of context. Also, it also means that you don't have the exclusive attention of the person that you're speaking with, which basically just translates that maybe the person is answering you like this fellow here, richly dealing with 20 other things, and maybe they have 15 seconds in between them, and like, okay, let me quickly look at this issue and answer what's about it, okay? So yeah, just keep that in mind. But in general, kind of like the key takeaway is that be polite and patient, okay? When you're communicating on a, for an open source project with someone, both as a maintainer or as the one reporting the issue, Remember, this is an open source project, nobody gets paid, so you should treat the communication accordingly. Whenever in doubt, always give a benefit of doubt. You remember, just because something comes across as rude might be just a difference in communication styles. And kind of like a bonus tip, always refrain from tagging people. Yes, you should not tag the maintainer. Most maintainers have their subscribe to their own project, so they're gonna get an email about it. If you just tag them, it just kind of comes across as Hey, I'm entitled, respond me now, I don't have time for you to get back to me, okay? However, if I actually don't respond within a week, it is fine to tag me because then maybe I, life just went by and I missed it and I didn't notice it. But don't open an issue and then, and then five minutes later tag me that, hey, tell me what's happening, okay? So, now, if you are a user and you're creating a bug report, some tips for you to have less frictionless uh, communication and more success in it. Always start first searching if there's already an issue for it. You don't have to open three different issues for the same problem. Bonus points if you can create a Docker image reproducing the issue, because this makes that I can very easily produce it and if I make a fix for it, I can easily test it, actually fix it, or maybe it doesn't work for your use case. However, if that's not possible, at least do create some short reproducible, ideally in a GitHub repository that I, I can easily clone, to actually test it that what you're reporting is actually happening. That being said, always fill out those kind of like templates. You definitely should always provide what environment you're running on, how you install the package. Uh, you should would be surprised how many times people report issues that are related to downstream repackages. For example, if you are on Ubuntu and you install the package by using AppGet, probably the issue could be that the packaging downstream is broken rather than the project is broken. Uh, and always post full stake test of error. Nothing angers me more than when I someone po posts the last two lines of a stack trace and I'm like, nah, I don't know. I mean, I want the entire picture so I can actually uh, understand what's happening, okay? But generally speaking, when in doubt, it's never, it's always better to provide more information than less because the more information you provide, the better context I have, the more likely I'll be able to answer your question and will not have to have two, three rounds of like, hey, can you provide me this information and that information just so that we kind of like can get to a solution. Okay, so back for maintainer uh, kind of like responsibilities. Your responsibility is also to groom incoming feature requests. What this means, you definitely need to look at when someone asks for a feature, and option A, you say to them, yeah, great idea, we should do this. Do this before you open a pull request because you're gonna feel a lot less engraved when I close it that we will not do this. Okay, so first start with an issue. If I say that, hey, you can go for it, great. Then we can open the pull request for the actual feature request. But it's also a maintainer's responsibility to actually say no. Remember, kind of like the puppy paradigm here. When you come to me with a great feature that would be great for everyone, I don't just look at the great feature and its initial cuteness that, whew, great for everyone. 
I also have to consider all the problems I will have that. Remember, that puppy will need to be maintained for the next 20 years. So it's my responsibility to then take it to the vet, give it food, clean up after it when it has inevitably a big pee in the middle of the room. So I need to consider all that. So if I say no, I'm not saying no because I don't like you. I'm saying no because I looked at the plus and the minus and I decided I don't want to deal with the entire package as a whole. But maybe it's a really cute dog and I'm going to be like, yeah, of course, let's do this. Okay? So, when you're feeling for feature requests as a user, first read the documentation. Maybe it's already there. It's going to save us everyone a bit of time. Second, if in doubt, open a discussion first. GitHub has this great feature nowadays when you can actually open is discussions rather than uh, like questions rather than uh, issues directly. There we can kind of like more formally dis or informally discuss about, hey, is this a good idea? Maybe how we should fix it? Maybe there's already a solution, a workaround, rather than have to create that. Also, finally, always indicate if you're willing to actually do the work. If you come along and I want this great feature, but I'm not willing to do it, that's going to be probably more likely I'm going to say no to that. Because if I have to spend a week to do it or no one else is willing to do it, it's like, yeah, great idea, but it's not really. <laughs> so. If you're doing willing to do work, it's always going to make things go a lot further. Okay? Now, another feature that you're going to see the maintainers always have to do is actually review the pull request. You're the kind of like the gatekeeper who has to say, like, whenever a pull request is done, hey, great, let's do this. Once you merge that, the maintainer is the one that actually has to cut the release for it. For example, here you can see it's on a GitHub release with nice information about what has been done. Always a maintainer, it's great to always thank your contributor. Once you merged it, you can go back occasionally and say, hey, this has been released. Many people appreciate that one, assuming you have the time for all that. But generally, if you accept the pull request, always thank them so they feel appreciated for doing the hard work. Okay? Now, also as your task as a maintainer, to ensure that the project doesn't kind of like devolve in mayhem. It should have like a nice architecture. This is more of an art than exact science, but some general rule of thumb I discovered through the years is that make sure the project has the right separation of concerns, and when someone opens a pull request, they put the right code in the right location, kind of. Uh, when adding new code, it gives us to say in the appropriate section. And for example, if the project has a plugin system, okay, I generally tend to recommend use the plugin system and register the plugin rather than add it as directly to the core. This will make sure that kind of like the plugin system is good enough so other people can add this code. And it's also a great test ground to validate your plugin system if your project has one of those. Okay? Now, if you are maintaining a project, always has a release change log. I really don't care if it's just a GitHub release page where people can see what happened, or you go more fancy and you add it actually in your documentation, as here you can see. But somewhere, show what was happening in those releases, so that as the user goes to it, can actually see what's the change between versions and what actually happened. Do they care enough to upgrade, or maybe they're happy at the older versions? Okay? Now. As you can see, there's from all this, it's quite a lot of work. Uh, can keep you busy. So it's a great idea to let other people help you out. Now, the downside of doing this is actually you have to do a lot of work to let other people help you. But this is kind of like an investment. It's going to pay off eventually, but not initially. So it's a bit of an investment. But you always should aim to make easy to contribute to the project. This way, if one day you had enough and you move on, other people can keep up the mantle more easily. And it also means that you're going to burn out a lot later, which means in essence, you're going to be around a lot longer to actually maintain that project. So this is not a kind of like wasted effort, but you do have to do some things. Like one of the things you always should write as soon as you open source your project, write a short documentation on how to actually contribute to your project. So that people wanting to contribute can kind of like easily pick it up. Okay? You can get fancier. You can have like, if you see here, like even a dedicated page in your documentation, which a lot more information, like architectural consideration and stuff like that. But the very least, you should provide, like for example, you see here, how to actually set up a dev environment, how to run the test suite. That's like kind of like a minimum I would expect from a project. Okay? Now, it's also your responsibility, the maintainer, to make sure the CI is green. It's nothing more frustrating than wanting to contribute to a project. You open a pull request and the entire CI is broken and you're like, well, it wasn't I who broken it, but then 
they never can release it until the CI is green because 99% of the maintainers will not actually merge uh, breaking CI just because it's not you who broke it, okay? Another thing that you should also ensure that, making sure that the CI runs daily. This way you can actually ensure and set up kind of like an email reminder for failures. So this way whenever the CI break, you as a maintainer can get notified that, hey, now something's broken, you should check it out so that the users wanting to contribute can actually do that easily. Another thing that's also very important, make sure that the CI is fast. The faster the CI get, or whenever the CI gets slow, it basically discourages contribution. If I have to open a PR to your project and it takes half an hour to actually run the CI, I'm not gonna wait around for half an hour and I move on with my life and maybe I forget about it entirely. So then it's just kind of like gonna come back a month later that hey, actually that's never merged, why? So if the CI is fast, it's more likely I'm gonna stick around, check it out what's happening, cool. If there's some failure, I'm gonna fix it. And in 20 minutes later, everything's good and I can move on with my life, okay? So this is obviously not always possible, but at least having a quick feedback loop means that people will more likely follow through and you have a better experience to it. Remember your documentation is just as important as your uh, project. So please add your documentation to the CI. Don't make it out of bound. And ideally, you can also enable for read the docs pull request uh, documentation builds. So this way you can actually see if someone updates the documentation, how it would look. Maybe the formatting is bad and you can provide quicker feedback for them and they can see it quicker too. Okay? Uh, and yeah, and the previous uh, kind of like uh, update about making sure that your CI continues being green. Yeah, that applies for documentation too. So for example, here on the Read the Docs website, if you sign in, you can actually see if your builds are failing or not. And you can set up an email reminder if they do break for that. Okay? Generally speaking, also it's a great idea as a maintainer to release often. One, this encourages smaller diffs. So if you break someone, you break them less often. Two, it also encourages contributions to contribute more often because if I see, I can try, I make a contribution and I can try it out in five minutes, I'm gonna be much more likely to make another contribution because hey, if I want anything changed, it's gonna be, I know it's gonna be a quick uh, feedback loop rather than I need to wait a month later or two months later. And I'm like, okay, so I'm stuck for two months now. I know Armin yesterday in the keynote spoke about having like, lovely dev builds or whatnot that you can in Rust, you can link directly to the GitHub issues that's not, or the GitHub repository. That's not always as easy, especially in corporate environments. So it's much easier just to let them use that code as quickly as possible. So continuous development or deployment, it's a great idea generally. <laughs> so try to do more of that. Always define the versioning policy. This is also very important as a maintainer. So the users are actually familiar what they should expect when it comes to breaking changes, what is the deprecation policy for the project, stuff like that. Also as a maintainer, you should be the one defining the coding standards. Basically, what is required for a PR to be good? For example, you should uh, require every change to have a test attached to it. This is something that your future maintainer self will thank you because it means it's less likely that you're gonna break those features going ahead. Even though it's some work at the time of the PR, in the long term it does pay off. And finally, every change should have a change log attached to it. Unless it's just like a small change only impacting like the CI or something like that, the user should know about it in some way or fashion, okay? Also your job as a maintainer will be to define what is good enough code quality. This is kind of like subjective, so it's great to take the emotion out. Tools such as originally black, now rough, or pre commit does a great job at this, where basically, hey, I'm not the one saying your code is bad, the CI say it's bad because it's red, okay? So don't look at me. So, generally speaking, a consistent architecture is better than a perfect slash great one. And generally remember, if you and the maintainer have a disagreement how something should be, the maintainer is always right. That's purely because they're the one that have to look after that for the next three years and not you. So again, kind of like ground rules. Okay, uh, another thing that I kind of like run into like good naming things is very hard. Similarly, creating good PR title and body are also very rare. Usually generally don't tend to do, uh, do a great job at it. So you as a maintainer, whenever you're merged, it's kind of like your job to kind of reword it and make it nice looking. 
And generally, I don't think it's a reasonable expectation to enforce users to do that really well. And if you do squash merge, for example, in GitHub, it really doesn't matter because you can always correct it before you merge it to look decent enough. Okay. So now, how do you actually attract people to contribute to your project? Your issue tracker is a great async channel. You can also create sync channels to it, uh, such as Discord servers. This is also probably more interesting when your project has, a, let's say, at least a few 10,000 users, because before that, probably you're not going to have a great traction on it. You should always advertise your project. Uh, conference talks like this are great for that, just so people know about it, and they can maybe try it out and see, hey, this is great. I want to use it more. Uh, and also, occasionally do check in on the Stack Overflow and answer some questions, and maybe kind of like uh, kindly guide your users toward your issue tracker for the future such questions. But generally remember, just because you have an issue tracker, not all the questions will be there. And if you want your project to be successful, you should also follow these additional channels too and follow up on them and answer them so that the people don't walk away frustrated. Okay? Now, uh, how to attract maintenance centers to project? This is kind of like the million dollar question. I don't have a great answer, though I have some things that work better than other things. So if generally, if people contribute a few times and their work is high quality, invite them to be a co-maintainer. They don't have to stick around for six months. If they seem good enough, they seem to be in good enough standing, uh, meaning they are not paid by the Chinese government to hack your project. It means generally, you should have a great time. You can look at their past contributions and like, yeah, they look fine. You can invite them to be around. They don't have to be the sole maintainers. They can be, it's much easier if there are five maintainers on the project because everyone can do a bit of it rather than having just you and maybe being very strict about things. Okay, so be slightly liberal when handing out these uh, maintainership invites. It encourages people to contribute more because now they are maintainers and they're like, oh, I actually care more than if I would be just a drive-by contributor. And always mentor them if that's possible. Uh, so for example, have video calls with them initially, kind of like just explain what it means to be a maintainer of it, give feedback for at least the first few weeks on whatever they do, involve them in the decision making, ask them to do a few releases. You don't have to be the only one doing the releases. And basically make sure you're not in hot pads so they have all the knowledge they need to step in in case you are on a holiday or you decide to move on from the project. Okay? Now, why do you should become a maintainer? So this is the carrot part of the things. So, it looks good on your CV. It does broaden your horizon because you meet new people and you, you learn different communication styles as you have to communicate differently with different people. Also provides you potentially some mentoring experience when you're kind of like mentoring new ma maintainers or contributors. You can get some thanks from the people. Uh, also, it gives you an opportunity to use new te technologies, Python versions and libraries that maybe you might not have readily available at your workplace. And finally, it's also a handy source of topic for conference talks, such as this one. So no longer need to think about what, the, what you should you submit about. And finally, you can also potentially get paid for it in some way, especially if your project becomes quite successful. Uh, in this one, we do have a few websites and a few sites later where I can say. So yeah, you can get paid indirectly by your employment if they allow you to do some of the open source development during your work hours. Uh, such as my company allows me to do. You can have GitHub sponsors. You can also use Tidelift to get some monthly income for the more popular projects or thanks dev, which is like one-time donations for the similar benefit. So if you have a mildly successful open source project, remember to kind of like try to get all this. You might not necessarily get paid well to make a living out of your own, but it's always good to have like a, once a month you can take your wife out for a lunch out of what you get from it, okay? And as uh, Samuel said yesterday, you can, that's the great time to say sorry for it that you spent all that time maintaining that project rather than with her. Okay. So generally though, as a maintainer, you should accept it that this job will never be done. There's no such thing that the project is done. Always be patient. Users are really bad at documentation, me included. Whenever I read other documentations, I miss a lot of things. And then I'm like, oh, why did I ask questions? It's obviously on page three on the documentation. Like, okay. So, but generally, eat your own dog food. Don't try to take advantage of your position as a maintainer. For example, I work off forks. I make PRs like everyone else. I kind of like try to walk the same path I preach when I say how people should contribute. 
that's an easy way to actually kind of like see if that's working well or not. So how do you become a maintainer? Pick something you actually use uh, on semi-regular basis. This is important because it means you're already kind of familiar with the project, and two, you're kind of like actually get some benefit of making that project better, okay? So generally, I don't think it's a good idea to pick a project that you never saw, never, maybe you went to the sprint and you first saw it at the time and you never used it for any other projects. It doesn't work out in the long term, okay? Now, read the documentation in the detail is step one, so at least you get familiar with what the project wants to do, what its many capabilities. Then read a few issues and see if you can understand them. What is the problem, where the fix could be in the code. And then reach out to the current maintainer and see if your approach is correct to solve that problem or not. And finally, this is just really just the rings and repeat parts. Do a few contributions. If you stick around for a few weeks, 95% of the project will ask you to be a maintainer because maintainers are that high in demand, kind of. <laughs> Not a lot of us walking around. So, but my recommendation is always, always start with an easy issue. And I think an easy issue is kind of like in this uh, order that I enumerated here. First is uh, improving the documentation. We maintainers are really bad at writing documentation, not because we don't know what we're talking about, but exactly the opposite. We know too much about the project and we don't know what uh, new users don't know about it. So making changes to documentation is great for new people. Add missing tests is also great because no maintainer will say, hey, I have too many tests, go away. It's like not happening. And finally, adding a feature is great. Bugs are something that I generally tend to tell people not to do because some bugs can be deceptively hard. Like you're like, oh, this small feature, I just need to fix this small bug. And you know, five minutes later, you rewrote half of the project to actually fix that bug. So it's not always a great experience to do that one. And finally, it's okay if you decide it's not for you, a few weeks of doing this, and you're like, hey, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to walk off. That's perfectly fine. You do, shouldn't be say, like, once you start it, you have to finish it. Okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind is that contributing to an open source project is like starting a new job. You're going to be horrible initially. You're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have huge imposter syndrome. Nothing makes sense. What is even here? But as you persist through it, you're going to get better. It's okay if you feel lost. It's okay to ask help and kind of like expect the bumpy learning curve. What it means, you're going to initially be you know nothing what's happening. Then you know enough that you're like, oh, I actually kind of like understand everything that's happening. And then you're going to realize that you know nothing. <laughs> and then eventually, if you stick around, and in my experience, this is usually around five to six months sticking around, you're going to be reached to that happy nirvana endpoint. You're like, yeah, I know everything about this project, and I can three in the morning tell what's happening. Okay? So. You as a maintainer, there's nothing more important than ensure you can keep doing it. And in order to keep doing it, you need to make sure that you prioritize both your mental and physical health. No, it's not worth you spending five hours a day on it if you're going to burn out in three weeks or in three months or three weeks, whatever. It's much better to maybe just do it one hour every day or one hour every week if you can, then it means it, you can keep doing it for two or three or five years. Okay? So. And also fine to sometimes just walk away for a few months and say, I just need time to off from this and I can get back out later. Okay? Now, how long should you keep expecting doing these maintaining projects? Well, as long as you enjoy it, mostly. Uh, and or also as long as you mostly use the tool or library or questions. For example, I had a project I was maintaining back in like 2016, which was written in Java after I no longer use Java for a few years. I was like, I probably shouldn't be the guy maintaining it because I have nothing. I don't really keep up to date with what's happening in this language. It's totally fine to give it to someone else and walk off in the sunset. Okay? So yeah, that was more or less my uh, fast-worded uh, advice to you. I hope you're gonna, it's going to encourage you to start uh, contributing to more to projects in a more successful way. And yeah, and thank you for your time. <laughs>